Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, we're going to be going over fluid and electrolytes. This is another Kahoot. Before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video. You're going to love it, so go ahead and press that thumbs up button now so you don't forget. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already, and don't forget I'm now offering Next Generation NCLEX review sessions. You can reserve your spot by going to my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. While you're there, be sure to check out the audio lessons I have available. Those those audio lessons are made specifically for students who are currently in the nursing program. If you have an exam coming up and you have to do really, really well, check to see what audio lessons I have available. If, excuse me, if I'm covering um, a subject that's going to be on your test, I suggest you go ahead and grab yourself an audio lesson. Almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics across my other social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook, and of course here at YouTube. So thank you for watching. I encourage you, I encourage you to uh, check me out on my other social media platforms. The name, my handle is the same everywhere, Nexus Nursing. All right, guys, without any further ado, let's get started. Fluid and electrolytes. First question. Which electrolyte is important for keeping the resting membrane potential of skeletal, smooth, and cardiac muscles? Is it sodium, potassium, calcium, or magnesium? We're talking about the electrolyte that's important for the resting membrane potential of skeletal, smooth, and cardiac muscles. Very good. The correct answer is potassium. So that's important for you guys to know. You need to know that potassium has a very narrow therapeutic range. It's 3.5 to 5. If the potassium is outside of that therapeutic range, if the potassium is too low, it's less than 3.5, it's too high, it's higher than 5, it can cause muscle weakness, it can cause cardiac dysrhythmias, even death. Okay. So potassium is a very important electrolyte to know. Which electrolyte influences excitability of nerve and muscle cells? It's also needed for muscle contraction. Is it sodium, calcium, magnesium, or phosphate? What do you guys think? You guys are doing pretty good on the live. Calcium. Your range for calcium, the normal range, therapeutic range is about 8.5 to 10.5. You know, most people, when they think of calcium, they think of bones and calcium is very important for the bones. It keeps the bones nice and strong. Um, keeps the bones from being porous, but calcium is also um, needed it it influences the excitability of again, like you saw saw nerve and muscle cells. The patient, if they have hypocalcemia, that means the calcium is low. But where, guys? Where would it be low? In the blood. So if you see hypocalcemia, that means the calcium is low in the blood. If you see hypercalcemia, that means it's high in the blood. This is very important because for some reason, when you guys would think about calcium, you always want to think about bones. So you see hypocalcemia and you're thinking the calcium is low in the bone. No, it's low in the bloodstream. Emia, that ending E-M-I-A, that's for bloodstream. Hypo, low, calcium, emia, hypocalcemia. Guess what? Remember, I told you the range is 8.5 to about 10.5. When the patient's calcium is low, so it's lower than 8.5, patient has hypocalcemia, you want to know what you may see? Muscle and nerve irritation. Patient may experience tetany, right? Start doing this, right? You see the spasms of the hands. If you take their blood pressure and you start seeing this, that's the positive trousseau sign. Or you touch your cheek and you see them start going like this, right? That's the positive Chostec sign. Um, those are two signs that are positive for hypocalcemia. Make sure you guys know that. 
All right, type in your answer. Which serum electrolyte will decrease if the sodium calcium is elevated and it will increase if the sodium calcium is lowered? So which electrolyte? If the calcium is high, it'll be low. And if the calcium is low, it will be high. Which electrolyte are we talking about? Type in your answers, guys. You guys are doing great on the live. Okay. The correct answer is phosphorus, phosphate. Um, the normal range for this, guys, is 2.8 to 4.5. And um, phosphate has an um, inverse, inverse relationship with calcium. So when the calcium level in the blood, emia, right? If the patient has hypercalcemia, the phosphorus level will be low and vice versa. They have an inverse relationship. Correct, same. All right, type in your answer. Which electrolyte influences the function of neuromuscular junction and is found in whole grains, and dark green leafy veggies. What electrolyte are we talking about? Type in your answer. Only three people got this magnesium, guys. Magnesium, this is important. First of all, the therapeutic range for magnesium is 1.7 to 2.2. Let's talk about this. Look at the question. Which electrolyte influences the function of neuromuscular junction? Let's stop there. Neuromuscular junction, guys, this is a site where the transmission for action potential, this is where it takes place, okay? So if there's something wrong with this area, the transmission of that signal, it's not going to go through. So that was your first hint. And then the rest of the question says you can find it in whole grains and dark green leafy veggies. It is magnesium. Make sure you know that level 1.7 to 2.2. Select all the applies. What were the signs and symptoms of hyponatremia and hypovolemia? So your patient's hyponatremic and hypovolemic. The sodium in the blood is low and the fluid volume in the vessel is low, okay? What are the signs and symptoms? Here's our choices. Hypotension, tachycardia, thready pulse, dry mucous membranes, dark yellow urine, poor skin turgor. This is a select all that applies. There's more than one answer. Very good, Rosie. Okay, you guys did pretty good, all of them. Not too many people chose dark yellow, oh, yellow urine or thready pulse. Okay, let's talk about this. Let's go through all of them so I can explain why all of them are the correct answer. First of all, we're talking about hyponatremia and hypovolemia. We know that the normal, well, you should know, the normal sodium range is 135 to 145. If the sodium drops lower than 135, the patient's hyponatremic. Now, fluid follows sodium. So when the sodium is low, when the sodium is low, guess what else is going to be low? The fluid. So sodium's low, fluid's low, patients at risk for dehydration. So let's think about what this patient's going to look like with low sodium, low fluid volume. First of all, hypotension. 
Why? I want you to think about this, guys. What is the blood pressure? All blood pressure is, is the tension that's being exerted against the vessel. So if your blood pressure is high, that means there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of tension being exerted against the vessel. Well, guess what? In order for there to be a lot of tension exerted against the vessel, there have to be a lot of what? Fluid pushing against the vessels, right? Either that or there's a lot of vasoconstriction happening that that will also cause um, the, the blood pressure to go up. So if the patient's hyponatremic, gone is the sodium, they're hypovolemic, gone is the fluid, what's going to be pressing up against the vessels? Absolutely not, nothing. Blood pressure is going to be low. So that's why hypotension makes sense. Let's look at tachycardia. Why would that heart rate increase? I want you to think about this. Your blood pressure is low. We know that the body needs oxygenated blood to survive. Blood carries oxygen, vitamins, minerals, nutrients, everything your tissues need to survive, right? Okay, we know that. If the patient's hypovolemic, fluid is low, the tissues aren't getting the fluid they need. Do, do you know your body's going to do no matter, it's going to do anything that it can to survive? It's going to try to compensate. So one of the things you're going to see is heart rate go up. The reason you see tachycardia, by the way, your normal heart rate is supposed to be 60 to 100. So that heart rate is going to go up higher than 100. Why? The rate is going to increase because it's trying to push out what? Oxygenated blood. It's trying to push out fluid. It's trying to push out those important nutrients that your tissue needs. Your body's not going to let you just plop over and die. It's going to try to do whatever it can to survive. It's going to try to compensate. And tachycardia is one of those compensatory mechanisms. Your heart says, oh boy, I don't know what's wrong, but the tissues are dying. Let me do what I can do to help. I can only do two things. I can speed up or slow down. It's going to speed up. All right. Let's talk about the thready pulse. Professor D, you just told me that the heart rate speeds up. Wouldn't the pulse be strong? How's the pulse going to be strong when you ain't got no fluid? Just because the heart rate speeds up doesn't mean the pulse is going to be strong. Think about it. Sodium's out the window. Fluid's out the window. So yes, that heart rate went up, but when you check the pulse, it's going to be weak and thready. Nothing there. How's it supposed to be strong? Are you guys following me on the live? Okay, let's keep going. Make sure you're picking up what I'm putting down. Dry mucous membranes. We know why there's dry mucous membranes because the fluid has gone out the window. You're going to see dry mucous membranes. You're going to see oliguria, decreased urine output. You're going to see flat jugular veins. Signs and symptoms, dehydration. Patients going to, you try to check their skin turgor, it's going to be tented uh, more than three seconds. Mm-hmm. Let's keep going. Dark yellow urine. Why would the urine be dark yellow instead of light yellow or amber? Well, because it's concentrated, patient's dehydrated. When the patient's dehydrated, that urine is going to be concentrated, duh. And of course, last is poor skin turgor. Patients got poor skin turgor because they have no fluid. They are dehydrated. That's a sign and symptom of dehydration. You guys got it? I'm going to keep going. All right, select all that applies. Which foods are high in sodium? Select all that applies, and I'm telling you right now, it's more than one. Here are your choices. We got canned foods, frozen foods, soups, packaged foods, deli meats, fresh fruits and vegetables. Remember your normal um, range for sodium is 135 to 145. That is the therapeutic range. Let's say you have a patient that has hypertension or they have CHF, they have a medical condition where they should not be eating foods high in sodium. What are the foods you're going to tell them to stay away from? You need to be able to recognize them because that's what you're going to be teaching to your patient. What foods are high in sodium? Again, your choices are canned foods, frozen foods, soups, packaged foods, deli meats, and fresh fruits and veggies. proud of you guys. Nobody chose fresh fruits and veggies. Very good. But only 19 of you chose frozen foods. Let me tell you something. 
if it's canned, it's frozen, it's any type of soup, it's packaged, it's wrapped in any type of plastic or, or um, what's that thing called? Um, carb, no, not carbon. I'm saying the wrong thing. If it's packaged, just know if it's packaged or any type of deli meat. Matter of fact, how, let's put it this way, guys. The foods that are going to be lowest in sodium are going to be the foods that are in the periphery of the store, like where the fresh fruits are, right? Where the fresh vegetables are. Everything in the middle that comes in a jar or that's boxed, or you have those frozen foods in the middle of the store, those are going to be high in sodium. That's important for you to know. That's right, Natalie, no frozen blueberries. The frozen blueberries, even though the blueberries are fruits, they're frozen, so it's going to be high in sodium. Very good. Type in your answer. Which electrolyte can be found in canned fish with bones, broccoli, oranges, dairy products? And here's your next clue. It's needed for vit um, vitamin D is needed for its absorption. In order to absorb this type of electrolyte, you need vitamin D. It's also found in canned food, uh, excuse me, canned fish with bones, broccoli, oranges, and dairy products. You need vitamin D for its absorption. Which electrolyte am I talking about? Very good, calcium. Calcium. So remember, guys, again, your uh, therapeutic range for ca calcium is 8.5 to 10.5. We know that it influences muscle and nerve contraction. We know that's important for keeping the um, bones strong. But you need to know the sources where you can find calcium. And you can find it in canned fish with bones, broccoli, oranges, of course, dairy products. And something important to know is that you could take as much calcium as you want. If you don't have vitamin D, you're not going to be absorbing that calcium. You need vitamin D for the absorption of calcium. And one of uh, the biggest sources of vitamin D is what? Sunlight, the rays. That gives you vitamin D. Which is the correct therapeutic range for pH balance? Is it 80 to 100, 7.35 to 7.45, 95 to 95% to 100% or 22 to 26. Very good. 7.35 to 7.45. That is your normal uh, therapeutic range for pH. Now, all the wrong choices, you guys all got this right. Great job. 80 to 100, that's the therapeutic range for what? Partial pressure of oxygen. 95 to 100, that's your normal range for um, O2 sat, oxygen saturation. 22 to 26 milliequivalents per liter, that is your normal range for um, for what? Oh my gosh, give me a second, guys. What's the method? HCO3, bicarb, right? So um, your kidneys responsible for bicarb, HCO3, and 22 to 26, that's your normal range. Um, I didn't have enough choices. Otherwise, I would have put 35 to 45. That is your normal range for CO2. Which organ um, is responsible for CO2? your lungs. Okay. So the lungs responsible for CO2, CO2 is 35 to 45. Your kidneys is responsible for bicarb. Bicarb is 22 to 26. One more thing I want to mention before I go on to the next, next screen. When we're talking about the lungs and we know the lungs responsible for CO2, there's only two things your lungs can do. Two things. That's it. Your lungs can either increase its rate or decrease its rate. That's it. So I want you to think about it. If um, the patient, their respirations increase. They start hyperventilating. They're doing, <laughs> they're doing what? They're blowing off CO2. But if their breathing slows down and they're holding on, 
What are they holding on to? CO2. Because again, the lungs responsible for what? CO2. It's either getting rid of it or it's holding on to it. Where your kidneys on the other end is responsible for your bicarb, HCO3. So your kidneys can shoot out a whole bunch of bicarb and bring up that HCO3 higher than 26 or hold on to it. Um, uh, what am I saying? It can shoot it out and make it higher than um, 26 or the patient can lose it. Patient can have diarrhea. Remember, base comes out the butt, right? They can have diarrhea. Um, they can lose um, some through the urine. There's other ways a patient can lose um, that uh, bicarb where the bicarb will be lower than 22. So when it comes to the kidneys, I want you to think of bicarb. I want you to think of HCO3. And then when it comes to the lungs, I want you to think of CO2, which is acidic. HCO3 is basic. All right, don't say I didn't warn you. You guys follow me? All right, type in your answer. Which organ primarily controls the increase or decrease of CO2? Oh, I got ahead of myself. I shouldn't have done all that teaching. Everybody better get this right. After all that talking I just did. That's what I get for being so excited. Hmm. <laughs> very good the lungs are responsible very good for the increase or decrease of co2 all right type in your answer which organ primarily controls the increase or decrease of bicarb that's what i get next time i'm just sticking to the questions I get excited and start teaching. <laughs> Someone said not the lungs, so they can't remember the organ, but they know it's not the lungs. <laughs> I know some of you did not still put lungs very good kidneys some people wrote typed in renal yes when we talk about renal we're talking about the kidneys very good correct which acid base balance would you find in a patient with pneumonia or airway obstruction or copd which imbalance would they have would it be metabolic alkalosis would it be metabolic acidosis would it be respiratory acidosis or would it be respiratory alkalosis what do you think i spelled imbalance wrong sorry about that patient has a respiratory condition such as pneumonia airway obstruction copd what do you think is going on with them very good respiratory acidosis to the four people that chose respiratory alkalosis i just told you when we're talking about the lungs, we're talking about CO2, which is acidic. So if the patient has pneumonia, they have airway obstruction, they have emphysema, they have bronchitis, COPD, they have a condition where they're holding on to CO2. That means they're holding on to what? Acid. And it's the lungs that's making them hold on to it. So it's going to be respiratory acidosis. Guys, read very carefully when you're reading these test questions because it's very easy. It, it, no, it's very easy. It's very easy for you to get confused and I don't want you to get confused. Okay, which acid-base imbalance would you find in a patient with severe anxiety, distress, acute pain, uncontrollable crying? What do you think would be going on with them? Would you suspect metabolic acidosis? metabolic alkalosis, respiratory acidosis, or respiratory alkalosis. They have severe anxiety. They're in acute distress. They're in acute pain. They're crying uncontrollably. What would you suspect? That's right. 
respiratory alkalosis because they're doing all that crying, they're in pain, they're doing, <laughs> and they're blowing off all that CO2. And we know CO2 within itself is acidic. So if they're getting rid of the acid, that's going to throw them into an alkalinic state. And the lung's responsible for that. So it's respiratory alkalosis. All right. Ooh, last question. Thank goodness. Which acid-base imbalance would you find in a patient with diarrhea or ketoacidosis? Would it be metabolic acidosis? Would it be metabolic alkalosis? Would it be respiratory alkalosis? Or, oh, wow. I meant to put <laughs> respiratory acidosis. Oh, gosh. <sighs> All right. Those who chose red and green, you are correct. It's metabolic acidosis. Why? Base comes out the butt, right? So patients got diarrhea, they're losing all of their base. So that leaves you with what? Acid. And we know it's not the lungs doing it, right? So it's metabolic. We're talking about the kidneys, kidneys acidosis. Okay, guys, you did a great job. Let's see how you guys um, fared. <laughs>